Hello, everybody, and thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Jenna Sistad, and I am with the Ocean Mammoth Health Alliance, and I am joined by my colleagues, Diana Rios and Marlene Alvarado. Today, we are offering health equity and breast cancer prevention in the LGBTQ plus community, and we are glad that you're here with us. Um, this is a partnership between Ocean Mammoth Health Alliance, Cancer Education and Early Detection, as well as Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Ashley Perper and Raven Gates about um, health equity and breast cancer prevention in the LGBTQ community. And then Raven's gonna take us through some screening resources in Monmouth and Ocean County that we may have access to or for the families that we serve. So thank you all for being with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. Yes, thank you, Jenna. So I'm gonna just take us through a little presentation, shouldn't take more than about 25, 30 minutes. Um, I do, it does look like most of us are from the provider side of things. So I apologize if any of this is review for you, but it's still always good to get a refresher. Now, let me make sure I can share my screen. Do we see a full PowerPoint and not my notes? Okay, great. We don't need to see my notes. I need to see my notes, but you guys don't. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Health Equity Series. My name is Ashley Proper. I use she, her pronouns. I am a community cancer control specialist at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. That's basically just a fancy way of saying I'm a health educator. Um, as most of us know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And say I'll be presenting on breast and chest health and cancer prevention in the LGBTQ plus community. Okay. Uh, just before I get into the presentation, I just want to remind everyone that this is for educational purposes only. Please see your doctor or a qualified health care professional if you have any questions um, regarding your specific medical needs, condition, or treatment. So here's just an overview of the presentation. We're going to cover cancer basics, some screening, diet and lifestyle, and genetic counseling. And just real quick, before we get started, I do have a little test for everyone. Um, normally I would do this as a poll, but I know we have some polls coming up at the end. So if everyone, if you feel comfortable, can type your answers into the chat. If not, if you have something near you to just jot them down, because we will revisit these at the end of the presentation and give the answers. So they're all true false questions. The first one is women under 40 years of age do not get breast cancer. So would that one be true or false? Number two, lesbian and bisexual cisgender women may be at a higher risk for breast cancer, true or false? Number three, obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer, true or false? And the final statement, there is no genetic test for breast cancer gene mutations, true or false. Again, if you feel comfortable putting your answers in the chat, go for it. If you wanna just jot them down or just even think about them, I'll just give everyone a few moments. I know I probably read them pretty quickly. Oh, I do see something is coming in the chat here. I can't see the chat, but I can see that people are chatting, so. <laughs> Yep, as of now, you have two people, three people who have uh, answered all four of the questions. Great, yeah, I can see the little bubble, but I just can't quite see the. <laughs> Do you want me to take you through the answers that people are putting or? No, it's okay. Because okay. we'll just go through them again at the end and then we'll see if anyone had any changes to their answers. Okay, and I'll track all this on my end. I'll copy paste for us. Perfect, thank you. I'll just give it another moment. Again, want to still be mindful of everyone's time as well. All right, it looks like we had some, some people answer in the chat. Some people may not be, so I'll just move on here. Again, we'll go over this again at the end. So if there was anything you were unsure of, hopefully you'll learn a little something. All right, so to start, we're gonna go over the cancer basics. So really just what is cancer? Well, normally human cells grow and divide as needed, and then the cells die when they grow old or become damaged. That is a normal process in cell division and you know everything. But then with cancer, some of the body cells begin to divide without stopping. 
and then they spread into surrounding tissue. Uh, so with these cancer cells, older damaged cells survive when they should have died off. Um, new cells form when they are not needed. These extra cells will just keep dividing and growing into the surrounding tissue, making growths called tumors. As, as for breast cancer specifically, there are three main risk factors. Uh, one is just having breast tissue. Having breast tissue puts you at risk for breast cancer. A family history of breast cancer and age. As we age, we become more susceptible to getting breast cancer. I say we because it does, it can affect everyone. So before we really dive in, we just want to go over some anatomy just so we have some background understanding of what we're even talking about here. Um, so we're just going to start this picture here. You probably can't see my mouse, actually. <laughs> this picture here on the right, the one that's kind of that cross section, um, you can see that each breast is made up of lobes and ducts. Uh, each breast has about 15 to 20 of these lobes that lead to smaller lobules, which produce milk. Lobules produce milk, while, and then the milk travels down the tubes that are called ducts to come out the nipple. And behind... The fatty breast tissue is our chest wall, which includes muscles on top of our rib cage. It's important to understand these different body parts because there are two main types of breast cancer. There's ductal car carcinoma, which starts in the tubes, and the lobular carcinoma, which starts in the lobules. In the picture on the far left, uh, we see that throughout our whole body, we have what is called the lymphatic system, which is colored in green in the picture. I know it's a little small, but we can kind of see all the little green squiggly lines. Um, these lymph vessels are a lot like veins that collect and carry um, stuff throughout the body. Instead of carrying blood like veins, these vessels uh, carry the clear watery fluid, the lymph fluid. And this lymphatic system collects this fluid, waste material, and other things um, like viruses and bacteria that are in body tissues outside the bloodstream. Think of this lymphatic system as kind of like a filtration system in our body that is important for our immune system. Have you ever, you know, been sick? The doctors told you you have like swollen glands in your neck area. This is really what they're referring to. It's these enlarged lymph nodes uh, because they're working hard to fight that infection. As you can see in the middle picture, the breast also has these lymph vessels and lymph nodes, which are colored in green. It's important to understand what lymph nodes are because if a breast cancer leaves the breast, the first area it goes to is these lymph nodes under the armpit here. Again, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I am pointing at them. <laughs> We can, Ashley. Okay, great. I have a dual screen going on here, so I'm just all over the place. So now what makes this sort of a unique discussion? Uh, most current cancer data research focuses really just on that binary of men and women. Um, and while there are disparities in breast cancer in the LGBTQ plus community, which we will discuss briefly in a few slides, a lot of research is limited due to the lack of SOGI data collection. So GD data being that sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, so here when it says, you know, breast cancer statistics or, and they keep referring, referring to women, I believe the reference is to cisgender women and those assigned female at birth that haven't had any breast removal. So basically those that are born with breasts. So we're going to just review some breast cancer statistics. About one in eight women, again, they're referring to one in eight people born with breasts. Um, will develop breast cancer in their lifetime, and the risk of cancer increases as the woman ages. From 2021, the American Cancer Society estimates that there are about 287,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer and a little over 51,000 new cases of ductal carcinoma, and that over, about 43,000 women will die from breast cancer. On this gray arrow thing, you can see that breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in women the first being lung cancer. In New Jersey, we are looking at an estimate 8,330 cases and 1,200 deaths from 2021. Now, this is very scary. You know, this is very, you know, bad news, but there is good news uh, with advances in earlier detections, such as mammograms and other screening and better treatment options. There are about 3.8 million breast cancer survivors living in the U.S. Now, it's important to note that those assigned male at birth, those who are born male, do also have breast tissue and they can develop breast cancer. As I said, the biggest risk factor for developing breast cancer is having breast tissue. 
both uh, born males and born females do have breast tissue. It does happen less often than in women, but male breast cancer can makes up about 1% of all breast cancers. Again, this is most likely referring to those assigned male at birth and that have not undergone any hormone therapy, et cetera. For 2022, the American Cancer Society estimates that for men, there will be around 2,600 new cases of invasive breast cancer and around 530 men will die from breast cancer. Breast cancer is about 100 times less common among white men than among white women. And it is about 70 times less common among black men than black women. As with black women, we will talk about this a little later as well, black men with breast cancer tend to have a worse prognosis. For men, the lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is about one in 833. One in 800, keep things simple. Um, now they don't know exactly what causes male breast cancer, but some of the risk factors can include, you know, getting older, aging, uh, having a genetic mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, a strong family history of breast cancer, a hormone therapy that has estrogen in it, having previous radiation to their chest area, and sometimes rare conditions such as Klinefelter syndrome, where males have an extra X chromosome, which produces more estrogen. So now we're going to briefly discuss uh, dis LGBTQ plus disparities in breast cancer. It would be great if I had some fancy chart or graph that could really highlight this. But um, as I mentioned before, with the lack of SOGI data collection, they don't have exact statistics on this topic. Um, according to the National LGBT Cancer Network, uh, we do not know nearly enough about cancer in the LGBT community. None of the large national cancer registries and surveys of cancer incidents collect data about sexual orientation or gender identity, leaving lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender cancer survivors uh, invisible among the vast wealth of information that these surveys provide to other groups. Other ethnic, geographic, and racial populations are able to use the data gleaned from these statistics to develop prevention and treatment programs uh, dedicated to the health disparities they face. Um, they know a little bit more about how prevalent cancer is in their communities, while LGBT people do not. Um, it's not commonly studied, researched, collected. Um, but LGBTQ uh, population does face unique barriers when accessing the healthcare system. Both preventative and essential care are affected, which can result in disparities in cancer risk and treatment. You know, there is reason to believe that LGBT people are carrying disproportionate cancer burden. Um, there is adequate research to confirm LGBT people have a unique cluster of risk factors that would lead them to having a greater cancer incidence and later stage diagnosis. While there are no biological differences that put LGBTQ people at a higher risk for cancer, there are many social and other factors that contribute to a higher burden of disease. In regards to breast cancer, LGB women have higher rates of diagnosis than their heterosexual counterparts. Additionally, lesbian and bisexual women have higher rates of a number of breast cancer risk factors, including alcohol use, higher rates of smoking, higher rates of obesity, and also they are less likely to have biological children before the age of 30. So they are less likely to have those children, they're less likely to breastfeed a biological child. And research has shown that breastfeeding is, a, um, is something that can reduce your risk for breast cancer. And research also shows that due to past negative experiences with healthcare providers, LGBTQ plus people tend to delay regular health screenings, which results in later stage cancer diagnosis and worse outcomes. Um, Consequently, can cancer of the breast tissue disproportionately affects the LGBTQ plus community. I feel this is important to highlight as well. Uh, people may belong to one or more marginalized group and therefore may have compounding disparities. For example, uh, someone who is black and also identifies as a lesbian may be at an even higher risk for developing breast cancer or being diagnosed at a later stage of disease. In this slide, you can see that there are disparities in breast cancer. In the left graph here, we see that white women, which are represented by this red line, are the racial group most often diagnosed with breast cancer. However, in the graph on the right, we see that black women, which is this blue line, um, have a higher death rate. So why, why does this happen that one group is getting diagnosed more, but another group is unfortunately dying more from it. Um, researchers don't know the exact reasons again, but it's uh, possible it could be related to socioeconomic status, lack of access to care or education, 
um, having that later stage of diagnosis and differences in the types of breast cancers, such as more triple negative breast cancers in black women. And again, if, if you belong to one or more marginalized group, you are going to have greater issues in seeking the care that you need. I'll just leave it up for a second because it looks like people are still looking at it. So I know we're going to talk a bit about screening after this, but I do just want to touch on it and why it's important. I know this slide looks very sciencey, <laughs> very sciencey, a lot of big words, um, but we'll we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, cancers do take years to develop. Um, we can consider cancer development as three phases, uh, which you know. The three phases of carcinogenesis, which means the process by which normal cells transform into cancer cells. Um, this includes initiation, which is, you know, at the beginning, they're the first cells to mutate, they're the first cells to get damaged. Um, then we have the proliferation of cancer cells during this phase, which you can really catch cancer during the screening process, early screening. This is really where something can get caught by like a mammogram or, you know, a pap smear for looking for abnormal cells in cervical cancer. Cancer prevention activities can prevent and detect cancers early. Uh, progression is the last phase in tumor growth. And this is when that tumor becomes really large, starts to become invasive, starts to spread to other parts of the body, will spread into the lymph nodes, et cetera. So we're really trying to catch cancers in these stages, those, these early stages where they have not spread, they have not grown, a lot easier to treat. Again, this is just showing that, you know, the earlier you catch something, the better it is. Um, you really want to catch things when they're at these smaller sizes before they spread. And also, you know, it's important to de detect early. This is according to the American Cancer Society and the CDC, that if you are catching cancers while they're in that local stage, there is a 99% survival rate after that five-year mark. Um, and that just decreases the later you catch cancer. Um, you know, the regional, so these cancer, the cells have spread beyond the breast, but they're still limited to those, you know, close lymph nodes in the armpit. There is that 86% survival rate. And then once it spreads and metastasizes to other body parts, um, there's only that 30% survival rate after the five years. Um, so again, really important, catch early, detect early, better outcomes for everyone. So here we have the screening guidelines for cisgender women. I have the three most common ones up here, American Cancer Society, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and the USPST, US Preventative Services Task Force. Um, they do differ a little bit, you know, ACS, which is what we really base a lot of our recommendations on. So between the ages of 40 and 44, you have the option to start your yearly mammogram, 45 to 54, you should be getting your mammograms yearly. And then 55 plus, you can switch to you know every other year, but the screening should continue as long as the person is in good health and expected to live at least 10 or more years. Again, there is some variation, but they all you know kind of agree that once you're in that 45 year age mark, you should be getting your your yearly mammogram. So now here we have the screening guidelines for transgender men, someone who was assigned female at birth. Um, these guidelines, the guidelines for transgender men, if they have not had any breast reduction or any mastectomy, you know, they just have the breast that they were born with, then the screening guidelines are the same for a cisgender woman, the screening guidelines we just spoke about. You know, again, following, I follow the American Cancer Society screening guidelines. So if you're between the ages of 40 and 44, you have the option to start. And then once you hit 45, you should be getting them yearly. Again, this is if you have not had any breast reduction, any mastectomy, et cetera. I have just in case. Okay, yeah, sorry. So, and if you have had surgery or you had a mastectomy, if most of the breast tissue has been removed, there may not be enough tissue there to have a mammogram. In those cases, a breast MRI may be recommended. Currently, there's no real consensus on screening if you've had that reduction. However, talking to a healthcare provider is recommended to determine the risks, especially if there's a family history of aggressive cancers. This is a perfect example of shared decision-making, which we will touch on in a few slides. 
So now I have the screening guidelines for transgender women, someone who was assigned male at birth. So this, again, this is, there's no clear, clear cut reason here. Um, the screening for transgender women is recommended based on estrogen exposure. So if you are, you were assigned male at birth, you are a transgender woman, but you haven't taken any hormones, uh, there's no real screening guidelines for you. Once you are on hormones for five or more years and you have that estrogen coming into your body, uh, they say to start getting mammograms or MRIs again, depending on the amount of breast tissue starting around the age of 50. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about tools for screening choices and breast cancer diagnosis. I spoke a little bit earlier about shared decision-making. Uh, shared decision-making is a process that involves the healthcare provider and patient having a discussion of the pros, cons, and uncertainties of screening. It shouldn't be a one-sided conversation and is based on evidence provided by your individualized case. Studies have shown that there is less screening when shared decision-making isn't a part of your normal healthcare visit. You know, this is especially important if there's a first degree relative that has had, has or had breast cancer, um, younger cancer cases under 45 years old uh, tend to be more aggressive. So having that screening discussion with your healthcare provider is even more important. In addition to breast cancer, let your healthcare provider know if there is any ovarian, pancreatic, and metastatic prostate cancer in your family history. Shared decision-making empowers you to take the next steps that are right for you and really helps you become an advocate for your own health. Here's just an example of a risk assessment tool um, recommended if you are between the ages of 35 and 85. It really just asks questions to determine your risk for breast cancer. I can share this link at the end. Um, I don't think I can click it on here, but this is just one of the tools you can have in your pocket to bring to your healthcare provider for that shared decision making. So let's take a look at what breast changes or chest changes that you may notice and you should speak to your doctor about. Um, again, this is for, for anyone, men, women, transgender men, transgender women, really know what your body looks like, know what your chest looks like, so you can see if any changes occur. If you notice any changes, bring them to your doctor ASAP. Don't wait for like your next yearly physical. Don't wait for you know your next scheduled appointment. If you notice any of these changes, really just bring that to your doctor immediately you know, any lumps, swelling, or color changes, size or shape changes, any new dimpling, pulling, puckering, or redness, uh, a new pain that doesn't go away. Uh, so if you have a sudden nipple discharge, don't ignore that. Um, any itchy, scaly skin or a, a new rash that doesn't go away. Again, this is, we can't stress this enough. You are your own best advocate. Really know what your chest looks like and then just note any changes. It really does make a difference. Uh, so breast cancer screening tests, again, I know we're gonna have someone talk about screening a little bit more in depth, um, but a mammogram is the most common form of breast cancer screening. Uh, we recommend this type of screening because it has been shown to reduce deaths in those with breasts. Um, a mammogram is an X-ray that can help find atypical or abnormal cells and tumors that are too small to be to feel during that manual breast exam. Now, while mammography is the gold standard for screening, it does have some limitations and there are a few factors that can affect the accuracy. This can include uh, breast tissue density, the skill of the radiologist, the size and location of the tumor, um, you know, age and weight, the timing of your menstrual cycle can have an effect as well. Again, if you, you also may not have enough breast tissue to get a mammogram such as just someone who has had a mastectomy for whatever reason. So MRIs can be used for breast cancer screening, radiation free can be used for those with high risk, um, with a high risk factor, or as we saw in the guidelines for trans men, it can be used when there isn't enough breast tissue for a mammogram. There are a few other methods that are being studied, uh, which include breast exams, thermography, which is based on temperature changes, um, so there are some other options if a mammogram isn't isn't the best choice for you for you. So screening um, is a procedure. You know there is you are going to a doctor for something. So there's going to just be inherent risks with any kind of procedure. 
But in most cases, the benefits benefits far outweigh the risks. Um, some risks include pain, bleeding, a false negative or positive, and just other complications that can arise. Um, so we also want to highlight that there are barriers to cancer screening, prevention, and treatment, especially in the transgender community. For many people, a lack of insurance is a barrier. Um, there will be resources provided at the end of the presentation if you are uninsured or underinsured. In the trans community, there has been a lot of discrimination. We also see that in minority groups, um, which leads to people just avoiding medical care in general. There can be anxiety about screening and discussing care when gender identity doesn't match your sex assigned at birth, or it can be very uncomfortable if it goes against your cultural norms. We do see higher rates of uninsured in the Black trans community compared to other groups. Another barrier could be transportation, really anything that would stop someone from getting to the doctor. There, another barrier that comes up in the trans community is people having a disconnect from certain body parts. This isn't just with breast cancer, but since we're talking about breast cancer, you know, if someone is transitioning, um, they're a trans man, they may feel disconnected from their breasts and just kind of ignore them. They might just pretend they're not there and seeking care for them might feel, feel awkward. You know, this comes up a lot with cervical cancer as well and prostate cancer. You know, if you don't feel connected to a certain body part, you're not going to take the time to focus on the care that it needs. Uh, so now we're just going to talk a little bit about diet and lifestyle and some things you can do to help prevent your risk of breast cancer, lessen your risk of breast cancer. Uh, so diet is important because there has been new research that shows that diabetes can be a precursor to breast cancer as well as obesity. These are both risk factors that can contribute to breast cancer, and they are both risk factors that can be controlled by following um, proper nutrition. Exercise is another thing that everyone should be doing. You know, people think of exercise, they tend to associate it with weight loss um, and weight maintenance and heart health, but exercise may also help to reduce uh, breast cancer incidence and tumor growth. It reduces sex hormones like estrogen and growth factors that have been directly linked to breast cancers. It also reduces inflammation, which if you did not know, is a cause of cancer. Exercise helps to lower high levels of blood insulin. High levels are linked to the development and progression of cancer. Exercise also improves the immune system. And, you know, so just by exercising regularly, we are reducing our cancer risk. Again, and it also helps to prevent obesity, which is then a risk factor for breast cancer. So, you know, general guidelines, it doesn't have, to, you don't have to be training for a marathon every day, just going out for a nice walk. I know we noticed the weather was, actually, I'm not even sure if it's still nice anymore. The weather was nice earlier. It's great to get outside, you know, go for a walk, get some fresh air. Another thing you can do is just reducing your alcohol intake. Alcohol can be a carcinogen. Um, drinking alcohol can increase your risk of cancers of the mouth, throat, esophagus, larynx, liver, and breast. Uh, the more you drink, the higher your risk. Moderate drinking is okay, uh, but keep in mind that moderate drinking, according to, you know, those that be, uh, is one drink per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men. Um, so if you are having more than that, that can increase your risk. I guess someone has put a note here that I guess um, it had been suggested previously that red wine has anti-cancer properties, but I don't there is no evidence of this, so don't <laughs> go out there saying, I drink red wine, it's healthy. It's still alcohol. Um, so just, yeah, reducing your alcohol intake can go a long way. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so now we're just going to talk briefly about genetic counseling. I am watching the time, trying to be mindful of it. Uh, so we did already discuss shared decision-making. This section, we're just gonna reinforce why it's important, especially if you are at high risk. So about five to 10% of breast cancer, case, breast cancer cases are thought to be hereditary, meaning that it's a um, result directly from gene changes that are being passed along from your biological parents. So genetic counselors can specialize in many different things, including genetic conditions, what further tests may be useful for a person and what best ways to offer support. So it's important to discuss with your healthcare provider your family history of cancer and seeing if a genetic counselor is the 
the right choice for you. You know, if, if any of these things on the slide re are relate to you, it is a good indication you may need to see a genetic counselor. Uh, you know, if ovarian cancer runs in your family, pancreatic cancer, male breast cancer, uh, metastatic prostate cancer. If you have a first degree relative with breast cancer, especially if they were diagnosed at an early age, uh, these are all signs that there may be a gene linked to this. So if you, if after discussing with a genetic counselor, you decide to go through with genetic testing, it is usually done as a blood test or saliva test. Um, it's important to know that there are lots of different genes that can increase risk of breast cancer. Um, this is just one example of a genetic testing panel. So it's really important to meet with a professional uh, for something like this and not just get those mail-in test kits like a 23andMe, which are great to, you know, they're great for fun, but they're not really great at, you know, helping you decide if you're going to get some type of genetic disease. So why is it important to understand the risk and have genetic testing done? Um, while the average cisgender woman or, you know, someone assigned female at birth who has still has breasts, hasn't undergone any surgery or hormone therapy, uh, the risk of breast cancer is about 12%. So about one in eight women that are at these high average risk. But if a person with breasts has a the BRCA genetic mutation, their lifetime risk of breast cancer is up to 87%. Um, so it's really important to know your family history and know if you do have these genetic mutations. You might start getting your mammograms earlier. You might get breast MRIs earlier. You know, They just might start screening you at an earlier age just so they can catch things earlier. I just said earlier a lot and I'm not really sure why. Um, so you know how to schedule a mammogram if uninsured and underinsured. Uh, we do have representatives from the NJC agency on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. If you do have insurance, you know, make an appointment with your healthcare provider, get a prescription for a mammogram, call and get it scheduled. So really just the take-home messages uh, for everyone, know your risks, uh, get screened, discuss any abnormal breast changes with your doctor, get relatively, you know, Good exercise throughout the week, maintain a healthy weight, uh, limit limit your alcohol intake the best you can. Um, and if breastfeeding is an option for you, then that is another way you can reduce it. I understand it's not an option for everyone. It's just something they like us to talk about. Uh, so now we are back to the post test. Um, again, feel free to answer in the chat if you'd like, or if you jotted your answers down, see if any of them changed. Um, I'll leave these up here for a few moments. If your answers are all the same, then you don't really feel, you don't have to put back. <laughs> I know I got number two wrong now from listening to the presentation. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to, again, just checking the time. I know we got started a little bit late. Um, so true or false, women under 40 years of age do not get breast cancer. That is false. Anyone of any age that has breasts can get breast cancer. It's just less likely. Um, lesbian and bisexual cisgender women may be at a higher risk for breast cancer. This is true just due to them having those higher risk factors. You know, they higher rates of smoking, higher rates of, of obesity, less likely to have biological children, and just less likely to get those preventative services from their doctor. Obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer. This is true. And there is no genetic test for breast cancer gene mutations. This is false. There are tests you can get done. Now I just wanted to talk about some services. The one thing that Rutgers Cancer Institute offers, we do have patient navigation services. If you don't know where to start or if you have questions, we are statewide. We can help connect you to a service that is you know, near wherever you are located. I'll share this all in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you have to copy everything down right now. Um, again, for more information, I will share their, their contact info. If genetic counseling or genetic testing was something you wanted to look more into, Rutgers Cancer Institute does have uh, the Life Center. They have their HOPE program which they can talk you through whether getting genetic testing is right for you. There's also resources through the NIH and the ACS. 
again, I'm going to skip this NJC because I know someone on the call can discuss it way better than I can. <laughs> um, but just here's where we will be talking about NJC. There are also cancer support services all across the state. Again, this is something I will share in a follow-up email. Um, just know that there are resources out there. It just may be a little trickier to find them. And then we do have a little evaluation survey. I can put the link in the chat for when we are having our discussion in a few moments. Um, so I'll just leave this up for now. Thanks for listening to me ramble for like the last 30 minutes. This was just a way to just introduce us all to the topic. And I believe now we want to have a little bit more of a discussion. I know Jenna has some polls that she is going to launch. If you want to launch them now, or do you want Raven to talk first? Um, I think let's just um, let's thank Ashley for her time and her presentation. It was great information. And if you can take a moment to do the survey, that would be wonderful. I would love to transition into Raven's talk. I know she's not feeling well, so perhaps we can get her to um, go through the seed services with us and then she can scooch off while we um, go through the poll together. Raven, if you're all set, um, you're up. That would be great. Hi everybody. Yes, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm here. I'm strong. <laughs> I'm still making it. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay. So I will be before you long, but Ashley, yes, that was an awesome presentation. Um, thank you for having seed in there as well, <laughs> um, having our information. Um, but a lot of what you what what Ashley went over tonight um, is basically the information that we share when we go out and educate those on breast cancer, um, as well as this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, but I do want to just highlight our NJC program, um, where the New Jersey Cancer Education Early Detection Program. If you haven't heard of us, we are in Monmouth and Ocean County. Um, NJC is a, a cancer screening program. Um, we are state and federally funded. We offer free to low cost screenings for uninsured and underinsured adults ages 21 to 64 who live in Monmouth and Ocean County, um, as well as we can connect individuals with primary care providers um, for all their medical needs. Um, as you'll see, I'll mention a little bit later about that. The cancers that uh, seed specifically covers is only breast, cervical, prostate, and colorectal. Um, our eligibility requirements for NJ seed are they would have to be a New Jersey resident over the age of um, 21 years of age and older. Um, we have had in the past um, some individuals come through under the age of 21, um, but that was more so case by case um, if they needed to get um, services done and it was approved by the um, our, our program manager or by the state, then we were able to cover um, that cost. But mostly our patients are 21 years of age and older. It is income eligibility based um, as well as um, they must be uninsured or underinsured. Uninsured meaning they have no Medicaid, no Medicare, no private health insurance. They just have, they don't have anything. We're able to help them. Underinsured gets a little tricky um, when I see this out in the community um, and sometimes to providers. Um, underinsured meaning that um, they can have uh, some type, if someone is, for example, um, struggling to pay their deductible or has a really high deductible, but they're saying, you know, but my income is still eligible for seed, we can possibly help them even though they are um, considered underinsured. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of that, but we do have that come up from time to time. Um, we also help patients that identify as she, her, hers, he, him, and his, they, them, and theirs. And I think this is an awesome presentation um, that was done today for the LGBTQ community um, because NJ Seed, um, a lot of times not many people know about us and a lot of our terminology um, is focused based on just women and men, but we are shifting and changing that to be more inclusive so that those who still need our services feel comfortable with us when we're talking to them on the phone, doing education, as well as them feeling that they can get these services and that we are sensitive to um, to their, their terminology as well as to what they need to get done for cancer prevention. prevention. Some things that um, C provides is education, um, outreach, 
screening. Uh, so we have a lot of screening events. Um, for the month of October, we had about I want to say eight to ten. Um, mammogram events where we were able to provide women in Monmouth and Ocean County free mammograms. Um, so that was really really awesome. We do them monthly, but of course in October. Um, we were able to get a lot more people in to get their mammograms, especially since the pandemic. Um, people are still trying to catch up on their screenings that they need to get done. So we've been able to do that and it's been awesome. We also provide case management. Um, we have a clinical clinical case um, nurse, um, Kathleen Zapsik, um, where, and as well as we have Edna Gomez, who is a case manager as well for specifically uh, Edna's with Ocean County and Kathy is with Monmouth County. So they stay up to date with the, the patients, the intake and consent and all the paperwork that I don't have to do. They are <laughs> in control of and handling, um, but they're, they're great case managers as well. Um, we do provide tracking, follow up with patients, as well as facil facilitation into treatment. Some screening services that we provide are clinical breast examinations. Um, Ashley had talked about mammograms. Um, American Cancer Society guidelines are age 45. Um, but for our grant, we still recommend people to go based on the provider's recommendation um, at age 40 um, to 64. Um, but again, that is based on the provider. Um, we provide pap tests, ages 21 to 64, pelvic examinations, um, the human papillomavirus test. We do not offer the vaccine, but we can connect individuals with um, local uh, clinical sites, um, as well as our Asbury Park CHCs, Keyport, Red Bank, if they have the vaccine or know where to get that, we do often um, recommend for them to reach out to those sites as well. We do provide diagnostic testing if results are abnormal, as well as fit FOBT tests for colorectal and referrals to treatment. And we also provide prostate cancer tests, um, the PSA, which is a blood test is a blood draw um, for men or cisgender men, for men um, wanting to get screened for prostate cancer. Um, most times when I, when I mention this, they're like, no, I'm not going to see that doctor. I'm not going to be violated. I'm like, no, there's a different way. There's an alternative to this. It's a blood draw where they can go and get a blood draw and see if there's high levels of PSA proteins in their bread and their, in their blood. Um, if there is, then that would be a conversation to see if they actually have prostate cancer. We also provide prostate exams um, age 55 and older for African-American males age 45 years and older, diagnostic testing if results are abnormal, as well as a FIT and a FOBT test for colorectal. All can receive cancer screenings under our program, regardless of their citizenship status. NJC is a non-reporting program. Um, in the community, we know that many are afraid that we're going to report their information. We try to, um, you know, implement and say, you know, we're not reporting any of this information, even though we are state and federally funded. We still want to give them those screenings, make them feel comfortable. We are not reporting this to ISIS or any immigration, nothing of that sort. So we're literally just trying to help them get the cancer screenings that are needed. If one is um, diagnosed through SEED, they will connect with our clinical case managers. Um, and this is the awesome thing I, I, I love about SEED is that even though somebody may come in, for example, and doesn't have health insurance and they find out that they do have breast cancer um, or cervical cancer, they're able to be put onto a presumptive eligibility Medicaid insurance, um, which provides to eligible patients if they receive breast or cervical cancer diagnosis. This helps them to lessen the burden of when they're going through treatment. Um, because SEED, we cover a screening and diagnostic. But once they are actually diagnosed with breast cancer, we can help them get on this Medicaid. And that Medicaid isn't just for their treatment services. They can also use this Medicaid for some of their primary care visits, um, as well as any other issues that they may be having outside of that diagnosis. And we also have um, a collaboration with Uber Health. We are able to assist individuals with the Uber ride um, to and from their scheduled uh, medical appointments. This funding was received um, for the SEED program. So this is only covering if a patient is a SEED patient, that they're enrolled in our program, they meet the eligibility guidelines. Um, Diana Rios, who was on the call, awesome, awesome person to connect with um, because she's the one that will most likely help those 
um, to get scheduled for Uber Help. And she's been doing such an amazing job um, when we had it our last grant year and we were able to get it this year. And she's been able to stay on top of that and getting people um, scheduled through Uber to get to their medical appointments. So we are helping, you know, lessen that burden and that barrier of transportation to get their cancer screenings. And as I come to a close, we are on social media. Um, we have an Instagram and Facebook account. This is where you can stay up to date with uh, many of our screening events, um, events that we're having in the community. If we're going out doing outreach or events that we are partnering with. Um, we have a lot of events that we're partnering with Ocean Mom and Health Alliance because we love them and they love us. So you'll see a lot of those flyers and a lot of things going on on our social media as well. And here's just some contact information from my uh, director, myself, and our case managers, as well as the number for our Monmouth and Ocean County line. If you know someone that is eligible, um, who you believe could be eligible for this program, please, you can have them call that number or you can reach out to me directly and I'll be able to get the information to them and connect them with our patient navigators and make sure that they get screened. And that's all that I have for today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Raven. We do love seed and we love working with you guys. Um, we are coming to a close, but before we do, I'm just wondering if anybody has questions for the presenters today. We have a lot of great information brought to us. And, um, you know, I know a lot of us work together and I see Eric has his hand raised. So go ahead, Eric, if you have a question, now's the time. Excellent. Uh, last of a question. One thing I just wanted to comment um, when talking about uh, trans men and chest screenings, um, we uh, also let me start with great presentation. Thank you so much for bringing up so many of these topics. Um, when it does come to trans men, it, there's sometimes it's more than just a disconnect from said body parts where they don't think about it a lot for a lot of our trans patients. It's, it's not that they don't think about it. It's that the dysphoria of these body parts not aligning with their gender identity causes a massive amount of stress. So it's not something that they're just not thinking about. It's something that when they think about, it causes there's major mental health barriers to accessing the services. So if we are going to make any referrals, if we're going to encourage this population to get chest screenings, um, it's just important that we understand that the providers we're sending them to for screenings are very trans. Um, trauma-informed care identified with that because if we send them somewhere for screenings and the person calls them breasts the whole time and they misgender them, it, the, the entire experience can be very dysphoric from the beginning. Um, but like, it's it's a thank you so much for bringing up this conversation. Uh, it's, it's definitely a major disparity among that community because it's something that they don't necessarily want to focus on and address, but it, everyone needs to. So thank you so much for having this today. Yeah, of course. And thank you for, you know, bringing that up. I'm always looking for ways to better describe things or talk about things. Um, you know, it is hard to talk about a community as a whole. It is, there is so many different identities that, that need specific things. So thank you for, you know, bringing that up and teaching me a way to talk about it a little bit better in the future. And Eric, it's wonderful too to have you as part of our coalition network because when we have specific questions or when we need more information or resources, we know that we can call you. So thank you for being available to us um, for things like this and other things as well. Um, does anybody else have anything to add or any other questions? Okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to Raven and to Ashley again for presenting and to everybody who attended tonight. We'll see you soon. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a Bye. great day.